today we will uh, start with the introduction or orientation with respect to security issues in paper 3 of general studies mains so generally uh, the paper 3 consists of uh, many areas like uh, economic development security issues science and technology environment and biotechnology disaster management etc right so in these one of the important area is security issue where the questions largely appear in every uh, year at least minimum a couple of questions appear from this particular part security issue and the questions are also more diverse encompassing many topics which were enumerated in the security part right so before we go into the general overview of the syllabus we try to have some references right we don't have a standard text uh, with respect to security issues but uh, you can largely refer the second arc reports so in that two reports can help you out one is the conflict uh, resolution report on conflict resolution second one combating terrorism so two reports conflict resolution and uh, combating terrorism will help you a lot and uh, in the market almost uh, many of the materials have been based on these two reports right? apart from that you can refer reports of ministry of uh, home affairs so either your annual reports of ministry of home affairs or press releases or any other documents which they have okay in their website and uh, the third one is idsa idsa website gives you certain current perspectives with respect to security issues especially internal and external and even country specific right so um, these uh, three ba basically gives you uh, almost all inputs apart from that you can depend upon your uh, newspapers and journals or magazines whatever it may be which you use it for current affairs so that you use it for current updates because uh, in security related issues there are two aspects one is static static another one is dynamic okay so static subjects are are part is something which is going to be very uh, uh, docile that is uh, conceptual general structure understanding and so on dynamic part is going to be steps taken the measures and various other aspects what we have clear yeah. so in this aspect we need to clearly uh, demarcate uh, the static and the dynamic part static part you can always take it uh, from these uh, sources which have listed whereas dynamic part you can uh, either uh, to an extent to you can depend on idsa and larger extent uh, you depend upon newspapers clear so these uh, are certain basic uh, aspects what we try to understand with respect to this fine uh, apart from this there is no special see, the the overall uh, security issues are technically easier part okay so you need to understand the interlinks you need to understand the basic structure how they operate that's all after that uh, you can just uh, enumerate some facts and uh, explain and almost uh, for all issues similar causes similar consequences similar legislations are there okay right. so we'll just quickly have a look upon the syllabus what you have these are words which are uh, verbatim found in your Uh, notification or syllabus of uh, uh, UPSC related to civil services. So you have certain uh, five basic uh, sentences provided: linkages between development and spread of terrorist or extremism, role of external state and non-state actors in creating challenges to internal security, challenges to internal security through communication networks, role of media, social networking sites in internet in, uh, in inter internal security. challenges basics of cyber security money laundering all these put together into one and uh, security challenges and their border management 
with respect to terrorism and various uh, security forces agencies and their members. See, uh, all these are basic tasks, but the uh, idea in which we are trying to approach this is slightly different, though we try to compare, uh, I mean, uh, study all these uh, uh, topics, we'll be largely moving on with interlinked mechanisms. Okay, so with the after orientation, we'll start with the uh, how development uh, and the spread of pessimism is. We try to find how internal and external, what are internal and external securities, how they are interlinked, and what are external security issues. So terrorism, how it is linked to borders, how it is linked to organized crime, how it links to external and non-state actors, and so on. Then we come to various types of internal security. We'll go with all types of internal security. Then we go for cyber security and then the security forces and so on. So we try to create a pattern out of it and then we are going to address it, okay? It's not that we are going to go in this particular order, but we try to rework this order so that it will be easy for understanding and we can uh, overall provide the basic structure what we have, okay? So apart from that, um, you can also understand that the security issue is closely related to your international relations. Okay, security issue is closely related to international relations. So whenever you read international relations and when there is some strategic difference or security issues, you can always use them or you can always use that perspective in this particular order or in this particular aspect, clear? Yeah. So this is a, a basic thing which you need to remember with respect to security. So security issue, it doesn't mean that you need to read here only. You will have some part which can be uh, directed from international relations, okay? So this is a basic idea and uh, an insight which you need to have upon the syllabus which you have in security issues. And uh, to be frank, in all areas, the questions have appeared in these uh, years from 2013 to 2021. So, I mean, 20, uh, almost all uh, areas. That is, uh, in these five segments, almost in all segments, we have questions. So that is a spread, what it, what it has. And largely, cybersecurity and the contemporary or emerging challenges are more uh, concentrated. Okay. okay, and it is more related to current affairs also questions. Right. Fine. So before going into the other aspects and larger perspectives, first we need to understand certain things, certain words, certain terms, which we actually come across in current affairs or in newspapers while we read. Okay. So first we need to understand the difference between safety and security. Right. So what is safety and what is security? Safety in the sense it is uh, a state of being safe, that means being unhurt, okay? Or uh, uh, we, we try to protect ourselves from injuries. It's a precautionary thing, okay? Largely, we put it uh, in an individual perspective, that is personal safety, your safety, my safety, right? Uh, women as a specific gender safety, child safety, okay? So likewise, we try to have safety which is more individualistic okay so or it will be on individual perspective or a small specific group okay it will be a very specific group whereas on part of security it is something which tries to provide the safety okay so as far as safety which is going to be uh, provided uh, taken by you as a precaution if someone gives you that, then we call it as security, okay? So we try to provide some security cover so that you will be safe, okay? So this is generally provided at large in the larger interest of the society or in the larger perspective of the groups or society as such. And it will be external. Someone who is involved uh, professionally will give you this particular security cover okay so we have safety cover we have security cover safety cover we take security cover they give okay 
So if you want to be precise in certain examples, you can see a bulletproof. So I wear a bulletproof to have personal safety from certain attacks. I have black cats, the commandos, uh, security persons surrounding me. They will provide security to me, whereas bulletproof will give safety to me. Understood? So the, the difference is that. So a bulletproof is taken as a precautionary method by me, whereas the security personnel have a duty or obligation to protect me from certain dangers. So that we call it as uh, security personnel. And that's why we call it as security personnel, not safety personnel. Okay. Then in car, you can see we have safety belt, which we use. Okay. And there is some safety airbag when it is unlocking or in specific conditions. So it will protect you. Okay. It will make you uh, free from injury or hurt. Whereas you have a lock, you have a GPS tracking system. All these are given to the car in general to protect the car in general, the people in the car in general, overall. Okay, so car plus you, that we call it as security. Whereas within the car, when you use to protect yourself, that we call it as airbag. Okay, safety uh, bells and so on. That is safety measures. So it is very clear that uh, um, overall we have both safety and security which has to go in tandem with each other. If security personnel are uh, ready to save you, but you are not having any precautionary measures and uh, you try to be aloof of it, then actually the personal safety is questioned. So the security may not be effective, okay? So security to be effective, the personal safety should be ensured. So a minimum threshold should be given to this particular aspect and uh, secu security will be the next level, the secondary level, right? So that's a basic thing what it is. Say for example, it's like a SRS bag, airbag, okay? So it's a second secondary kind of, clear? So in that way, uh, uh, a secondary system will work only when primary system is put in operation. That is, when, whenever you secure a safety belt, then only this particular airbag will work. When the primary safety belt is not uh, utilized, naturally the airbag will not work. So same way, we need to have the safety uh, cover taken up then only the security cover which is provided will be effective. It doesn't mean that they will not provide. It will be effective. Otherwise, it may not be. Clear? Fine. So this is all about your safety and security. So it, it doesn't mean that uh, safety and security is like a living versus non-living. Even, uh, say, for example, uh, you have Taj Mahal. You have security cover to protect Taj Mahal, right? So we have safety measures when we go into a particular uh, place, right? So it's more of precaution versus protection, okay? So it is precaution versus protection. Precaution, we try to protect ourselves. Protection, something is given from external side, clear? So this is uh, the basics uh, of uh, what you call the two word safety and security. Right. Then, as far as security, when we talk about national security, because here we don't talk much about personal security, we talk about national security. When we talk about national security, we have two basic classifications. One is external, the other one is internal. Okay. So for external, we have forces or uh, security personnel who safeguard against some external threat. Okay, across borders. Whereas here there are certain security personnel who maintain the security within the country. There may be, here you need to understand that, there may be some disturbances to the maintenance of security within the country from outside or from inside. Clear? So, from within the country there can be some issues. 
from outside the country there can be issues which disturb the security of the nation within the india so in that way what happens we call external factors affecting internal security internal factors that aid uh, external threat okay so there may be some issues within india external externalities will try to induce them try to uh, fire up them that we call it as external factors aiding internal security or uh, uh, i mean acting as a threat to internal security. there may be some institutions individuals or certain issues which act as a fertile ground where the externalities can use them to create a disaster that we call it as internal issues which has some uh, aid to the external uh, threats okay internal aid to the external threats and external influence on internal threats okay so it shows that they are both equally and mutually uh, inclusive right they are not two exclusive substances and uh, this is a traditional form of classification external internal but now in the recent times we have many other security also with the uh, national importance we call it as food security energy security environmental security health security financial security there are many such securities which are there okay that also comes under the security perspective clear but in general we classify them traditionally in external and internal in external and internal there are certain other new emerging uh, kind of and these emerging are nothing but food security energy security uh, environmental security nuclear security and so on. there are many financial various aspects social security right so likewise many such security aspects are there with respect to these type of security classification yeah so we will be largely talking about these aspects here in uh, these aspects you will be dealing it with respective subjects so here you can uh, consider Uh, what are the different categories here in external? What are the different categories of internal security threats we have? How they are interlinked? That is the actual core part of the syllabus. What we are going to deal with that. Clear? Okay. And uh, some important terms which you need to remember um, with respect to security, because uh, when they ask about causes for fundamentalism you need to be very specific about what it is so first we try to understand the different meanings of uh, uh, these words and then we'll go on for different aspects how they are interlinked the first one is extremism what is extremism extremism means something at the extremes right either their value or their theme or their methods or whatever it may be Okay, it will be to the extreme belief that we call it as extremism. So they are oppos uh, they are opposition to the some fundamental values what we have as a middle path. They don't talk about individual liberty. They the extremists will say, "Hey, why liberty? We need security at the most. Security is first. Even if you don't have liberty, it's okay." So that's the idea of extremist what they have. Okay. and they won't be much tolerant to other faiths or beliefs they don't respect rule of law for them this is the law and this is how you need to be and this has to be done okay so the basic values what you believe the extremists may violate it and they find themselves at the extreme set of certain values okay that we call it as extremist extremist may not be terrorist remember that okay they are people who are with extreme values they can be easily entering into terror mode because they are in the borders okay so they are in the border part fine then who is a fundamentalist fundamentalist are the people who basically believe that there is some set of religious teachings which they believe 
is going to be basic intrinsic essential than anything else in the society okay that we call this fundamentalistic so basic difference between extremist and fundamentalist is that extremist will be extreme in all values or thoughts okay extremity will be there whether they talk about freedom whether they talk about nation whether they talk about any other social issue they will have some extreme thoughts whereas fundamentalist whatever you talk first they will refer to their religion if the religion says yes then it is yes if the religion says no then it is no that's all it's so simple as it is clear so for example when you talk about individual liberty to them they'll refer religion how what religion says about individual what religion says about liberty and then they will decide the course of action right you want to put vaccine they'll refer again to the religion what it talks about if it is okay then i will otherwise i won't so there won't be any scientific temper there won't be any scientific outlook they will be always taking care of that religious teachings or preachings at the fundamental that we call it as fundamentalist then comes radicalist what is radicalist radicalist are something similar to extremist they have their extreme political social religious ideas but the idea is that they will undermine the or reject the contemporary issues or status quo of the particular contemporary ideas say for example a radicalist will say india will become developed country or uh, what do you call that uh, um superpower only when they have this particular aspects they won't accept any other philosophy and they will believe that their own philosophy is going to operate and that philosophy will be extreme okay so a fundamentalist is different an extremist is different a radicalist is different there are some similarities between radicalist and extremist when extremist become radical they become terrorist okay so the difference between the extremist and a terrorist is radicalist okay so that is a stage uh, in which how they go on because a radicalist will have a defined path a radicalist will have a defined method the radicals will find or try to uh, establish and achieve their ideas when they try to achieve their ideas or their political aims by the use of violence or intimidation they will called as they will be called as terrorist right a radicalist can be easily a terrorist so terrorism means something say terrorism doesn't have any standard definition in international law but in general anything which is violent and intimidating for political aims especially against the state okay then we call it as terrorism so understand the difference between the four fundamentalist extremist radicalist terrorist okay a fundamentalist can also become radicalist and he become a terrorist for a particular religion that we call it as religious terror right extremist can become a radicalist a radicalist can become terrorist that may be for, for some social terror or political terror or economic terror whatever it may be with that particular ideology of that extremist okay yeah. then comes insurgency so what is insurgency there is a difference between insurgency and terrorism insurgency means it's a, again a violent armed rebellion against the authority okay here it is a war from the beginning whereas here it will be an armed rebellion first and then only war and they will be organized in a very small numbers and they practice guerrilla warfare guerrilla warfare in the sense hit and run okay so hide and attack the most important aspect is that they will have the local support whereas the terrorist will not have any mass support or local support 
always the inter insurgents will have this local scale. That means there are some localized issues or problems from which insurgents grow. Since they represent the local issue or the problem, there will be a local support. Okay, so that is insurgents. One type of insurgence is left-wing terror, left-wing extremism. This we will largely deal with, Ex insurgency, all these. Terrorism, insurgency, left-wing, all these things we will be talking in detail in further classes. But these are some of the basic opening up of uh, pages, that's all. So left-wing extremism is an ideological war where they have some political and economic or social ideology. And they want to overthrow the current de uh, democratic government. And they want to establish their own ideological government. And that we call it as left-wing extremism. It is leftist ideology, right? They involve mass mobilization. They involve uh, various strategic uh, methods to attack the establishment. It will be largely against establishments, okay? That is government establishments, institutions, and so on. Whereas terrorism will be largely against people to terrorize the government, okay? Insurgents, they need not go against the state and uh, that is toppling a state or overthrowing a state and establishing a uh, government on them. But they will be largely targeting the state for representing their issues. If the issue is resolved, insurgency will stop. Okay? That's the idea. So they have slight difference on all the three issues. And when it comes to warfare, which is nothing but two different countries waging war against each other, there are different types of warfare. Here we saw some basic concepts, how the war or what, what is the background of the war, whether it is an extremist war or a fundamental war or radicalist entering into war, terrorist or insurgent or left. Whereas here we talk about warfare. In that, we talk about asymmetric warfare. What is asymmetric warfare? As the name indicates, it is not symmetrical. So country A and country B wage war between each other. Whereas country A has a very high capability, whereas country B has very less capability. Then we call it as asymmetric. Say for example, you have China, you have Taiwan. It's definitely an asymmetric combination because China and uh, Taiwan, definitely they are not going to be a uh, symmetrical power. Taiwan is such a huge resource with a huge army and so on, whereas China, whereas Taiwan, it is not, right? Russia, Ukraine. So Russia has huge resource versus, versus Ukraine doesn't have. It has to depend on other countries. So either it can be military capability or military uh, size, we call it as asymmetric warfare. In this asymmetric warfare only, you have some strategy which is followed called porcupine strategy, so which was recently in news. What is porcupine strategy? Like porcupine, which has only spikes on over its body, attacking or facing the danger of a lion attack or uh, any other larger attack. And uh, due to some strategic methods or tactics, it tries to terrorize the uh, animal which it attacks and naturally it will escape the route. But it's not that always it is going to have work out because if the lion or tiger is going to have a better strategy and they have a very, uh, what do you call, a death punch, then naturally, uh, they may lose, but uh, it is a, a strong offensive defense where uh, the opponent will lose much of their resources or motivation or uh, morale and so on. 
So asymmetric warfare, which is currently in practice, right? Then comes biological warfare, which you use biological weapon as the name indicates, either toxins or bacteria, virus, fungi. You know, Al Qaeda used a, a biological weapon, anthrax. The anthrax powders will be sent to various uh, thing uh, through post, and you involve in uh, terror attacks. Or else, in World War Two, we had sarin gas. Okay, so those type of attacks we call it as chemical warfare. Okay, so we had sarin gas, mustard gas, chlorine, phosphorus. All these are chemical weapons. So when you use organic components, we call it as biological. When you use inorganic chemicals, we call it as chemical work. If you use radiating substance, we call it as nuclear work. Conventional warfare, any warfare which involves all these, we call it as conventional, right? And they deploy everything at one go. In convention. Whereas in cyber, they don't use this war, these type of war, rather they go for technological attack, where it is information warfare or information attack. Cyber systems, that is computers, likewise. So they try to attack them. That we call it as cyber warfare. Similar to cyber warfare, we have information warfare, we have electronic warfare. Cyber warfare means a larger information system is attacked, okay? Whereas information means you attack the information asset and information itself, right? Say, for example, unleashing the other details, attacking the other system, and unleashing the entire other details is an information warfare, okay? Or attacking the information assets, like the infrastructure of the critical uh, infrastructures like power grids, communication, that is mobile uh, communication, financial uh, networks, banks, ATM cards, and so on, transportation, civil aviation, and so on, railways. When you just attack those informations, just uh, uh, attack through malwares, malfunctioning the systems, naturally, think when a power grid control system malfunctions, what happens? Power accidents will happen. When nuclear energy malfunction is happening, naturally, that it will be disastrous, right? So, information warfare is something attacking the information asset or the information itself. Yeah. Whereas electronic warfare means attacking with the use of electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, electromagnetic spectrum. Any idea on who had the first... Uh, such idea of electronic uh, warfare or something who visualized in future there will be some electronic warfare. Any name of the physicist or scientist? Yes. Any idea? No. Others? Hmm? So it was Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla was the one who predicted that there will be some time where the electromagnetic spectrum can be used as a weapon of warfare. And uh, this particular uh, thing, he also started devising one, but unfortunately, uh, he died before that completion of the project. But now, yes, it is one of the major threats, electromagnetic spectrum attacking the information or cyber systems using electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Then unconventional warfare. What is unconventional? You don't have a stipulated, uh, or what do you call that, uh, method in which you try to involve in warfare. You combine anything. That we call it as unconventional warfare. Okay. Or we also have some subsets called new generation warfare. What is that new generation warfare? 
not necessarily warfare need to be engaged in battlefield it can be in the minds of the people right terrorizing the people through psychological attacks okay what russia did on ukraine crimea it was a new generation warfare where it prioritized psychological psychological insecurity will be clear okay fourth generation warfare it is a warfare where all things blurs previously soldier is the one who fights a war civilian is the one who is protected whereas now it is not okay terrorist is the one who fights whereas civilian is not whereas now terrorist and the civilian are indistinguishable there are certain hybrid methods where a citizen becomes a terrorist and a terrorist becomes a citizen after the job so the distinct aspects of the spheres are now coming down blurring out so war and politics has a blur combatants and civilians that is soldiers and civilians blurs the citizen has to be more protective and they have to be more uh uh what do you call uh, they have to be more agile say for example in israel so every citizen is a combatant right so like this so this is what we call it as uh, this thing right then comes your um hybrid warfare so what is hybrid warfare hybrid warfare is a one which you use multiple aspects so all the above okay you use all the above or any of any one of the above in a mixed way that we call it as hybrid warfare okay there is a difference between hybrid militancy and hybrid warfare hybrid warfare means you try to use all weapons all methods all aspects samabeda dana dandam everything will be used okay so that is what we call it as hybrid war hybrid militancy is different which is emerging now in jammu and kashmir that we will discuss at large okay so these are some of the important warfare uh, methodologies which are existing or practiced now fine so some terror tactics are there here i haven't included guerrilla warfare because uh, you may know uh, guerrilla warfare the hit and run so that is also on terror tactic in newspapers you can come across a word called lone wolf attack what is a lone wolf attack as the name indicates lone wolf a single person or very small number of Uh, group that is one or two uh one person or two person maximum three they come spread out attack okay so mumbai terror what we had is a lone wolf attack in this lone wolf attack we have a concept called intifada intifada is a method which is utilized by palestinians against israel it's a lone wolf category okay on religious means india faced intifada okay suicide squad what is that suicide squad it may be a individual or a group of individuals who detonate themselves for killing others right so like lgt which used there are many other uh, areas which we had the suicide squad they have completely changed the idea of terrorism the phase of terrorism right then hijacking air jacking hijacking uh, ship jacking okay so so you try to hijack anything so it may be transportation vehicles or anything and then attack it or use it as a weapon to attack something Okay. previously hijack will happen so that they will kill the people in the vehicle later 
hijack was done to convert that particular vehicle into a weapon and uh, create terror attacks say best example you have 9 by 11 us attack they had hijack um what do you call aeroplane converted it as a weapon they just dashed over or crashed over the twin towers so the hijacking was once a terror attack but later that hijacked a web, uh, vehicle converted into weapon is a new form of terror okay yeah. then attacks by rocket and mortar that is uh, rocket uh, propelled grenades handheld grenades and so on they try to use so there are many methods but these are some methods which you find it in the current affairs usually okay that we call it as the important terror tactics what we use okay. so these are tactics now all these are there across india so we have external threat we have internal threat we had various other aspects how we address them okay so why i am trying to fix this first itself because to have some basic understanding on how we actually approach the security then only when we talk about internal external in greater detail you can relate these security architecture and understand what the weaknesses we have or appreciate what the changes we have made clear that's the reason why in the first class i try to give a idea on national security architecture from 1947 till 1991 we had the security architecture which we got from independent india okay so while independence how it was it was continuing for more than uh 50 years but till then why there was no much change because india faced only war faced that too conventional that too it was external right it was larger internally in 1960s we started having uh, insurgency but they were at beginning stage budding stage in 1970s we had left wing extremism that was also in a budding stage but that was a greater impact which it had than the insurgency so our national security was largely focusing on external than internal because why because the internal the public order or you put it as law and order police were largely a state subject so insurgencies or left wing terror whatever it may be they were left to the states to be dealt by the state forces rather than the central forces or the armed forces okay so that is a reason between uh, 1960s to 1980s why there was not much change in national security regime but after 1980s when indira gandhi started having stern actions against insurgents in northeast and certain co coordinated uh, power operations happened against um, left wing extremism fundamentally they understood that the national security architecture has to be changed so uh, patching work cherry picking 
reforms based on uh, problem that is current problem so likewise contemporary problems were patched up and they were reforming the system step by step on case by case basis there was no overall overhauling of the system okay but when the nature of the external threat came up because 1948 we had pakistan war 1965 we had pakistan war 1972 we had pakistan war or 1971 in 1962 we had chinese only four major wars we fought so after 1971 not much pakistan was also weak at the time because they were severed then so their terror activities between 1970s to 1980s were pretty less and uh, jammu and kashmir internal politics was more into rather than the external actors so national security was at its ease but after kargil and after the seriousness of left wing terror which we popularly or infamously call as red corridor when red corridor was developed when more than 130 districts were terror districts red districts and few districts were liberated by the naxals then we started concentrating national security at large concentrating both internal and external and that is the reason you have more reforms after 1991 and even the face of terrorism changed since 1993 and 1996 when babri masjid was demolished and a serial bomb blast started happening across the region we started having right wing terror we started having islamic terror we started having left wing extremism everything started to boom up in 1990s to 2000s right so almost by 2008 9 everything were were at its peak so they are moving towards peak so we started addressing the security architecture at large after kargil we had a task force which was set up and a case it pun in 1999 that task force largely addressed the changes which is dire required by the national security aspect and after that when kargil war happened kargil ravi committee headed by k subramanian brought out many serious changes which was initiated by kc pant commission or the task force and uh, after the recommendations of kc subramanian group of ministers in 2000 came out with certain solutions or implementation methods how to operationalize the recommendations of the kargil review committee which was not publicly disclosed and slowly there were some developments which happened between 2000 to 2011 when again nareshendra committee was established to have the overall review of the national security regime this was done because in 2008 there was a massive attack 2611 and then we had subsequent terror attacks naxal attacks and so on so we started having the naresh chandra committee there were even such committees which were appointed for uh, overhauling defense and that is how we started having a better uh, security architecture in india which we have now so what is that this is the top brush of the national security architecture prime minister is the head of the entire national security architecture prime minister heads cabinet committee on security nuclear command authority 
National Security Council. In all these, he has one exclusive defense advisor or a security advisor called National Security Advisor. The National Advisory I mean, Security Council, the National Commando, Nuclear Command Authority, uh, the advisor, everything, it was all put in together. These reforms slowly happened after 1991-96 only. The Cabinet Committee on Security consists of four ministries. So Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of External Affairs. Plus, Cabinet Secretary, National Security Advisor, and so on. These four ministries form part of National Security Council that we will see. After India having the second uh, nuclear test in 1998, after the 1972, the first one, we had created nuclear command authority, thereby democratizing the process of nuclear command, where you have in this nuclear command authority, we have political council headed by prime minister. We have executive council headed by national security advisor. And then we have Administrative Council headed by CDS, Chief Defense Staff. Okay. Under this Nuclear Command Authority, there is a Strategic Forces Command which is headed by a military officer who is in charge of the direct launch of the missiles. So they are the one who operate the missiles. You know, recently, there were some administrative disciplinary action or departmental actions which were taken against a particular officer and two other assistants in uh, the misfiring of Missiles, Brahmos missiles. Those comes under this particular command process. They are the final one who press the button for missiles. But they have to execute order only through the political or executive aspects only. They cannot, on their discretion, do that. Okay. So we will see National Security Council uh, subsequently. As far as National Security Advisor, the post was created in 1999. Rajesh, which was the first one to be so. And later we had Pini. So we had MK Narayan and we had uh, Shishanga Menon and so on. The most powerful post with respect to security in India. This National Security Advisor who is a principal security advisor for the prime minister, enjoys a cabinet level rank, who can attend the cabinet committee meeting on security, who involves a nuclear command authority, and uh, who can substitute prime minister as a head to convene national security council and so on. Very powerful person. Under the national security advisor, there are a group of bodies which gather information and enrich national security advisor with security information. To assist him, there are three deputy NSA who are appointed and one military advisor who is appointed. In defense ministry, there is a committee called defense planning committee in ministry of defense. It is headed by NSA. There is National Cyber Security Coordinator who is appointed. And that particular National Cyber Security Coordinator will report to NSA. 
who has all information about cyber security aspect in the country. Then, recently, we had this post created last year. National Maritime Security Coordinator. He will coordinate all the maritime issues, what India faces. Navy to Coast Guard, to police stations, marine police stations. All informations will be gathered and reported to National Maritime Security Coordinator. He also coordinates internationally, reports to NSA. Because India has a vast water uh, coastal line, 7,515 kilometers. Then we have intelligence coordination group. This intelligence coordination group is headed by NSA and they give information from all other uh, governmental organizations, from cabinet secretary to various other organizations like RBI, SAB, etc. All, all department. It consists of around 30 members. All departments. Same way, joint intelligence committee. That also consists of bureaucrats. All bureaucrats who are there, top officials. They will form the group and they will provide information. Then we have technical coordination group for technical advice with respect to cyber and other technicalities. They will also report to NSA. And there is one organization, National Technical Research Organization, one of the most important organization in India for technical support, cyber, nuclear, all types of technical issues. NTR was a apex body. They report to NSA. Therefore, one can understand that NSA is one of the powerful authority, and uh, they try to address all issues with uh, with respect to security. When he addresses cabinet committee or National Security Council. He has all information through this aspects. Okay. Fine. So this is the National Security Architecture where the National Security Councils, how it is. Okay. So we are talking about this. Okay. How this National Security Council is. If there is a convene, uh, convening of National Security Council happens. Prime Minister will head the, he is the head of the National Security Council. He deputizes Prime Minister, National Security Advisor. Then, Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, previously Planning Commission, now, Niti Ayo will participate. Deputy NSA and military advisor will participate. Okay. Union Minister for Home Affairs, Union Minister for Defense, Union Minister for Finance, Union Minister for External Affairs will participate. Okay. So, four ministers, three deputy NSAs, Vice Chairman and uh, NSA Prime Minister. So totally 10 people will meet together in the National Security Council. Okay. They will bring information from all other segments which are represented. Not, don't mistake that the entire structure which is given in the slide will meet, okay? Only those 10 people will meet. Whereas, NSA will bring information from this 
hierarchy. Same way, National Security Council has separate groups. They will also provide information to the National Security Council Secretariat. The Secretariat advice will also be provided. But the members will not participate because all these members are 20 group, 30 member group and so on. They will provide only reports. Strategic policy group, same way the uh, ministry wise uh, policy members will be there. National Security Advisory Board, bureaucrats will be there. They will all come under NSA. NSA and National Security Council will be assisted by National Security Council Secretariat, which include Joint Intelligence Committee. Okay. Union Ministry will bring information shared by RA or your uh, in, uh, intelligence bureau. Intelligence bureau has its own hierarchy. We have many uh, state level centers to collect information. All these are coordinated by a multi agency center. Okay, the name of the center is multi agency center because it coordinates multiple agencies. This multi-agency center is headed by IB, Intelligence Bureau. And uh, research and analysis wing, the raw external intelligence, that is intelligence and counterintelligence outside India. So they will consider all these things and they will come up with certain information. Whereas Union Ministry for Defense have an apex body called Integrated Defense Staff under CDS, okay? A newly created position called a CDS. And this CDS hits three agencies. That is, Chief Defense Staff hits all the three agencies, Defense Space Agency, Defense Cyber Agency, and Defense Intelligence Agency. Defense related space issues, defense related cyber issues, defense related intelligence. Everything will be carried on by CDS. Whereas Union Finance Ministry will provide information of financial systems from Economic Intelligence Council, that is the Apex Council, headed by Union Finance Minister. Okay. There is Central Economic Intelligence Bureau, which is headed by various heads of the financial agencies, like Income Tax Department, Customs Department, and so on, Narcotics Bureau. They will all give information. Central Economic Intelligence Bureau. There is another unit called Financial Intelligence Unit. That is a most powerful unit. Actually, this unit is the one which represents India in Financial Action Task Force, an international body created by G20 in dealing with fin financing terror, money laundering, etc. So for all international issues with respect to finance, Financial Intelligence Unit is a nodal agency from India. So they have international perspective on finance. They will provide information to Ministry of Finance. So Minister of Finance will get information and that information will be utilized. Apart from that, we have Ministry of External Affairs. Ministry of External Affairs provides their own perspective of external threats originating from various states, what steps can be taken, and so on. So, when National Security Council meets, it is a meeting which is very significant 
with uh, various informations which are passed from different quarters of the nation. This is an organization which has a complete idea of national security, both external and internal. Clear? And uh, this particular National Security Council is the one which uh, has a very clear-cut idea on how to deal with the entire security aspect. And they try to pass on orders or strategies, how to deal with that. And respective ministries will have their own implementation agencies. That is, these are all intelligence. Okay. What are all the things what we have said or dealt with with intelligence or information gathering. Using this, we need to implement the law. For that, we have some enforcement agencies. Or we need to investigate something. We have investigation agencies, which are the other arm of other departments. Say, for example, Ministry of Finance runs Enforcement Directorate, the information, I mean, Income Tax uh, Department has its own investigation team. For Defense, we had the Defense Forces. Hope they have their own enforcement uh, agencies, the Central Armed Forces, Paramilitary Forces, and so on. Right? So they will take care of the the in actionable, that is the intelligence. What are the actionable intelligence we have? Those will be given. And that actionable intelligence will be enforced or investigated with, and the security of the nation is ensured. Understood? So this is all about, what do you call, the basic intro on how the security issues are. In the next class, we will deal with how this security issue or the internal and external security issues are related to governance, um, what we call development and so on. How the uh, linkages are there. Okay, that we'll see in the next session.